Ah, Janeja is here. He was having trouble in uh, logging. I had called him. So. Yeah, no, I was waiting on the other side for a long time. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So then, uh, then I guess we, uh, it's time to start. Great. So uh, welcome to the second day of this uh, workshop, and we have three speakers like yesterday, and they're all uh, very well-known people. And uh, so I'm going to use just short introductions to them, uh, as just mentioning their, uh, where they are and uh, their relation to uh, their work in COVID-19. So Professor Sandeep Juneja is currently the Dean at the School of Technology and Computer Science in TIFR Mumbai. His research interests lie in applied probability, including sequential learning, mathematical finance, Monte Carlo methods, and game theory analysis of cues. Lately, he has been involved in modeling COVID-19 spread in Mumbai and in the mathematics of such epidemiological models. He is serving on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission also. Uh, the title of his talk today is uh, Modeling COVID Spread in a City Through Simulations and Some Algorithmic Enhancements. Sandeep. Thank you, Arup. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this seems to be working, right? Uh, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, you are. You can see your screen. Can you see? Can you see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. You have to just enlarge them. That's all. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so I'll take off then. So yeah. this is, uh, you know. Uh, so I'll be talking about the simulation tool that ISE and TFR, some folks from both sides that divide together early last year. Uh, but the work I'll talk about is, a uh, lot of it is, you know, our projections for second wave and potential third wave. And that's with Dutch Mittal. And uh, I'll try to just go on algorithmic enhancements as well. And that's with both Dutch and Shubhadda. So Shubhadda Agarwal is a PhD student in TFR. Daksh Mittal is a... Uh, you know, Bright RA, he finishes undergraduate from IIT last year, and now he's a research associate uh, working with us through IDFC Institute. Okay, so this is uh, our earlier work. These are just reports that we generated. Um, uh, you know, we, these are reports that we, these are not like uh, in-depth, rigorous papers. So we're just calling them reports and we're not really submitting them, except for this first one, which was, uh, you know, which was actually a journal paper. So in this, uh, the key colleagues were my faculty colleagues, uh, Prarad Harsha, Ram Prasad Safta Rishi, Piyu Srivastav, and then uh, from ISC Bangalore, um, Rajesh Sundaresan. So together, all of us had built this simulation tool, uh, which I'll be describing, and then, then there were other people as well, uh, many students and uh, research associates who helped with this effort. All right, with this, let me move on. Uh, so the talk outline is, you know, we'll briefly review the agent-based simulator to model cities, and I'll basically focus on Mumbai. Uh, I think we had a fairly good understanding of how things happen in Mumbai now. Discuss some of its successes and a failure. Uh, so we all know the failure. Uh, the second wave and the potential third wave. So I'll talk about these things, you know, what we were able to say about second wave and what we are saying currently about potential third wave. And then we'll discuss the key drawback of uh, this whole computational approach. It's enormously computationally intensive. Each simulation run now takes more than 10, 12 hours. So one needs to do something about this. So we develop a deeper understanding of the probabilistic structure of this. So what we have is an agent-based simulator model where you know all the 13 million people in Mumbai are individually modeled. So that makes computation enormously difficult, you know, time-consuming. So we'll uh, deeper, develop a deeper understanding of its probabilistic structure. Uh, so for the statisticians and uh, probabilists uh, in the audience. So initially, we'll observe that what we have is essentially a branching process. So I'll talk about this at the right time. And then thereafter, once you have enough people who are infected, you know, then the, the time at which they get infected, the state at that time is random, but thereafter the evolution is more or less deterministic. So that's the mean field behavior. And we'll talk about how to combine the two in the right way. And the upshot is that you can simulate a 13 million city using a smaller 1 million city, essentially with no error. And with what we call shift scale and restart features. So I'll explain these uh, when I get to them. Uh, Okay, so agent-based simulators allow for detailed modeling. So we got involved in this, uh, you know, in March last year, 
when we saw that COVID was coming to India and we heard that Ferguson and team at Cambridge had their simulation model and they were reporting enormous potential fatalities in UK and US and that was affecting policy change. So then we learned more about their simulator and uh, you know both were kind of independently thinking about this and then we got together with ISC and we developed this tool. Our tool is in C++ and probably is enormously fast for all the complexity that we have and probably you know the comparable to the best in the world. We've not done any comparison, but our sense from many tools that I've seen is that, um, you know, we probably have some of the uh, better computational features in it. Okay, so what's very quickly, what's an agent-based simulator? So we build a simulation tool. For Mumbai, it's going to have 13 million agents. We'll plug in the population information there. So demographic information we get from census data, you know, how much of population in is, which age group, how is the population geographically distributed? You know, ward-wise, we have information. Uh, how do, you know, how much fraction of people are working? How far do they go to travel? How many people are going by local trains? Very important for Mumbai. So all those kinds of features. So we basically try to come up with a synthetic city on a computer, which is a realistic match for uh, Mumbai as a whole. One doesn't need it to be terribly realistic. You need to get the big picture right. And, you know, we're not looking for... 100% accuracy here. You know, we want to get the trends right, basically. So then we want to model how people interact. You know, they interact at home, they interact in schools, they interact in communities, they interact in workplaces. Uh, so we try to capture that in a reasonably accurate manner. So this is some of the data that we have from Mumbai. Mumbai is divided into uh, 24 wards. We further divide 24 wards into slums in that ward and non-slums in that ward. Slums are enormously crowded, so it makes sense to model them separately. Uh, so then we, you know, we've generated the synthetic city. I'll just summarize again. So we include the demographics of the population, employment, you know, how many people are employed, where are they employed, geospatial data for each locality, high density slums, non-slums. We get the age, household, family distribution, workplace distribution, school size distribution. So we try to get all of these right. Origin destination matrix for compute, uh, commute patterns. How many people are using public uh, transport, private transport, buses? So to some extent, we capture this accurately. Uh, at some point, you have to make a decision how accurate you want to be on things which don't really contribute that much to the output that you're looking for. So initially, we, uh, as I said, we create this 30 million city. So I'll just give you the dynamics of the simulation. Big picture, uh, one doesn't really need to go into detail. The city is seeded with infected people. So we do some calculation you know, I'll talk about the calculation precisely later, but we come to some idea of that, you know, we're going to see the city with 100 infected people in February. What's the right date to infect it? So that thereafter, the, fat the fatalities that we see early April, which was result of basically no intervention, you know, when the lockdown had not really affected the fatalities, we match those fatalities. That's kind of the thinking. You know, we choose our parameters and the start date to get this thing to match. At each time set, each susceptible person's exposure rate is computed. So now we are going to proceed as follows. By the way, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to interject. Um, I can't see the chat from here, uh, so I can only hear you. Uh, okay, at each time. So what we are going to do is as follows. And this is a very nice effort. It's primarily by Ferguson and, and others, how to linearize this computation. You know, 13 million people, pairwise interaction is going to be 13 million square. That's massive effort. So how to linearize it. So what we do is we sweep through each and every person amongst these 13 million people. We go through all the susceptible people, and for them, we compute the exposure rate. So we look at the exposure rate that they have at home. If there are people already infected in the home, how much chance, they, how much rate are they contributing to these guys, this susceptible person getting exposed at workplace, in community, in trains. And the idea is as follows. For example, in community, now in a community in a ward, there are lots and lots of people. The way we model it is we find the amount of infection that's present in the ward, and with that, we come up with kind of a central total amount of infection present in the world. So that's one number that we compute. That's a linear computation. And then with once that number is computed, then we say, okay, how often is this person engaging with the community? And with that, for each susceptible person, we do this calculation. So we basically do this all in linear time. Similarly with trains, we do all the calculations in linear time. So we compute for each susceptible person, what's the rate at which it's going to get infected and then we flip a coin, essentially with this probability. Delta T for us is uh, one-fourth of a day. So every one-fourth of a day, we're going to refresh our simulation. It's just being pragmatic. You, know, you could have to chosen one eighth or something much smaller. You just increase your computational burden. So at that time, you flip coin, 
you find out who all got infected and then whoever got infected infected just means exposed to the disease then you have a disease progression cycle for that person who is exposed you know exposed person will remain undetected uh, you know will not show any symptoms for 4 or 5 days there's a probability distribution that has been calibrated to data in Wuhan so for that many days okay this person is hidden there after the person becomes infectious he he or she may di- di- display symptoms may not display symptoms but they become infections and then whoever people they are meeting they might be infecting them they might be contributing to their rates uh there after a coin is flipped and we decide whether a person is symptomatic or person is was asymptomatic and has recovered if the person is symptomatic we decide how long is the person going to be symptomatic and uh, during that period again they are infecting others some people can be super spreaders many most people are not super spreaders all those variations are very easy to do in the simulation model and you know so but disease progression now carries on without interaction with others i mean interaction is playing a role only in that you are infecting other people okay so all of this is done now you increment your time now you have new people who are infected old people who are infected earlier some of them have recovered some of them are still infected so they again engage with each other cause more infections some recoveries happen and time moves on and you basically see the city evolve now on top of this you put all the restrictions lockdowns have come in that means movement restrictions have happened trains have stopped that means you know people can't use trains so this becomes inactive these kinds of things you plug in and then you see what happens So is this clear any questions on the big picture uh, so far uh, So this is a simulation model lots of coin flips you capture the probabilistic behavior but it's very detailed we are capturing each individual uh, in the city uh, So what does disease progression means so let me just tell you very quickly so a person when they get exposed they stay exposed uh, on mean 4.58 days i think this is gamma distributed then they become infectious for mean of about half a day 60% of people now we use 55% with delta variant become uh, uh, asymptomatic and recover 40% become symptomatic on an average 5 days this again is gamma distributed then you are hospitalized in a age dependent manner so if you are higher age then there is higher probability of being hospitalized you stay on an average 8 days and then some fraction of people again in a age dependent manner they become critical and they could stay critical for 8 days now 8 days was when we were with the old variant now we use 18 days we looked at oxygen consumption data and larger number makes more sense we still need data to get all these things right and we are enormously constrained by data so in that sense you know we are living with old wuhan data with some adjustments from here and there when we get more insights and data okay and these are just a matrix of okay in each age group what's the probability that if you are symptomatic you are hospitalized what's the probability if you are hospitalized then you become critical if you are critical then you die so those numbers uh, you know we come up with this number somehow So this is based on data from China, and we made some adjustments for India, but really we'd like to make make much more. All right, and this is some basic interventions. Now in our model, we do all kinds of things. You know, so let me just explain some of them. Lockdown. What does lockdown mean for compliant households? So we say, okay, some fraction of population is compliant in slums. Some fraction of population is not compliant in slums, and non-slums. These fractions can be different because it's hard to be compliant in a slum when you're in a very crowded area. uh but what happens then is that household infection rates get doubled because you're staying a lot more in your house no workplace interactions except for 25% of people so essential services continue so they will still go to work but the remaining people are not going to work so no infection coming to them for work community interactions reduced by 75% so again the community rates come down by that much for non compliant households workplace interactions only have a leakage of 25% so if you're non compliant then you go to workplace much more often community interactions in that case are unchanged household interactions decrease by 50% these are all kind of numbers you know you use common sense to come up with these numbers so one may ask how do you know that these numbers are right they are probably wrong but you know we use these numbers we use some other broad numbers like levels of compliance and we choose them to match the initial pattern so you presume even if you got something wrong here you got something wrong there together you're matching initial pattern what the numbers you've got by and large will continue the relationship that they have even if it's wrong overall if there's some cancellation of errors going on and that will continue in future and we see by and large we see that happening now along with this we can model all kinds of other things including uh, you know a new variant coming in so much more infectious whoever they infect infects other at a much faster rate uh, vaccinations coming in vaccinations can be very effective not so effective so we vaccinate people at some time we give them with some probability they become better some probably they don't, don't become better all of those things so that's a, the beauty of simulation model that all these details can be incorporated quite easily okay some past projections for mumbai just to complete the story uh, 
So this is our October report. This came out in late October. And what I'm showing to you is this picture. So let's just focus on the picture. You know, the details are information. You can have a look. But these red bars that you see are fatalities per day. So you'll see in May 1st, approximately you're seeing about 50 fatalities per day. So y-axis is number of fatalities, right? So you can see the fatalities were non-existence in March. Then they started going in April. Then you saw this massive exponential growth uh, early April to, uh, to uh, you know, May. And then the fatalities actually peaked. And then they started coming down. You have these gaps here, presumably because of, uh, you know, the data was poor. You know, some fatalities were incorporated later. Some never came about. And then... Sandeep, can you enlarge the slides a little bit? It's too small. Uh, to... A little bit. Oh, this will be hard to enlarge. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, mind. Okay. Just, uh, I think you can avoid reading things. Uh, yeah, so this is, these are the red bars of the fatalities till, uh, you know, till late October. This is the forecasting was done in late October. These curves that you see are projections from a model under different scenarios. So a few things I want to indicate to you. Initially, we match the curve Essentially, we see that, okay, in overall India, when fatalities began to grow exponentially, presumably these are isolated clusters which are growing. So how do fatalities grow in isolated cluster? We find that rate and we match that rate in our model with some adjustments. You know, we want to argue that, okay, infections happening in communities, homes, and workplaces should be about the same, uh, more or less same in number. So with that criteria, you know, we get this slope right in our model. Then we choose our compliance numbers amongst population. So this, you know, over around here also, we are matching the data well. And thereafter, we pretty much see everything going, going uh, you know, uh, without any change of parameters on our side. So we don't change parameters every month or every few weeks. Just set, and they work quite well. The only thing we needed to do was here. So in our September report, we did not have this bump. Everything, otherwise, our projections were very similar. They were going down in the same manner, but we did not have this bump. So this was because, you know, when we came up with these projections in September, we were naive to the fact that Ganpati is a major super spreader event. So a lot of people gather together, there's a lot of interaction, and that led to this bump. It's also interesting because it's, you know, one indication that, you know, people intermixing even outdoors and maybe also the indoors leads to, you know, super spreader events, leads to infection growing. So we saw that here. But we asked ourselves, how do we capture this? So during festival, we increase the community transmission rate by two by three. And reduce compliance to for you know reduce compliance also at that during that time just for a short period, and we saw that that matches very well, so that was good for us. You know we just wanted to get you know intuitively do the right thing and get a good match because then we could use it for all the other festivals that happen later, and we could actually say that all the other festivals whether it's Diwali or Christmas or New Year's will not really cause a major bump because by that time a lot of population would be infected, and that turned out to be true. So this is all we could say at the end of the October. So this is our projection. This green line is where if you were to open the economy, the trains, etc., on November 1st, that did not happen. Orange line is if you were to open the trains, etc., on uh, 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 January 1st, they were actually open on February 1st. But you can see that, you know, one month after opening up, fatalities don't change. So fatality numbers as per this model till February 1st would, would be, as per our, this would be our projection, even if the economy was opening on February 1st. So this is what we did, and this is what we saw on the right-hand side. So you can see that you know the economy opened up on February 1st overall. And uh, by and large, we are doing a pretty good job of matching the fatality numbers. Uh, now, we are underestimating here. Orange curve is much lower than the actual fatalities that we saw. This is, you know, first of all, this kind of error we live with. With our kind of model, we don't expect them to be very, very accurate. We just want to get the trends right. So this seemed like, okay, not such a bad job. Uh, and underestimation was expected because, you know, we didn't model the fact that as uh, things begin to improve, people change, people change their behavior, they become more lax, there's much more intermingling. If you accommodate for that, then actually you got a pretty good match here. So by and large, it looked all right. And this was our projection going forward. You know, you just shifted by month. We expected a small peak when you open up the economy. So by this time, okay, things looked okay. Even when cases began to rise in February, we were not so alarmed at that time because this was expected. But then you saw pretty soon that the cases were rising much faster than we had anticipated. So it seemed that something else was going on. So basically, we became quiet. You know, What was going on is as follows. So this is what we would have expected. 
and this is what we saw a much much higher second wave here so you can see you know around here once you adjust for laxity of population till mid march you're matching the data pretty well so it took us a while you know even by um, by end february we knew something was going wrong but it was not quite clear you know because there was some genome testing done sequencing done and they said okay not, no new genome has been found so it was not clear to us that okay maybe there's a dramatically different variant going on nonetheless we started to you know just kind of pay attention to the data once it became clear that you know you can't explain the data from just laxity of population then we started playing around with okay having a variant and what we did in our report for second wave was we tried all kinds of scenarios we asked ourselves okay by april we see this you know in march there's a very slow kind of uh, rate of growth in fatalities but there's a steep increase thereafter in april so this convexity how do we explain so we tried all kinds of things and i'll just mention a few later but you can see our paper on this our report on this but we found that having a variant in small amount on february 1st now why february 1st because that's when the economy opened up if you had a variant early on and cases are coming down it's not going to increase very much we saw that in our simulation it increases at a very slow pace but when you open up things that's when it dramatically grows so we saw that if you start with 2 and 1/2% variant in february 1st by mid march or so it's about 60% it's become dominant and by end uh, by early april you know a lot of fatalities have already begun to happen and you know they rise steeply because now people are getting infected by the new variant so we can actually exact more or less replicate this behavior as you see in this picture so new variant explain this and our computation was new variant about 2 to 2.5 times more effective than the earlier variant explains this data quite well just to tell you that you know we were kind of groping in the dark it's not like we had other data to look at ask a question vidya sir vidya please yes yeah so your duplicate two to two and a half percent it doesn't match with what the um, the wet lab experiments say you know they're saying 1.7 times and that's also i think an overestimate so you know no, no this 1.7 is with respect to alpha the kent variant and the kent variant itself is estimated to be about 50% more infectious than the earlier variant wuhan variant so yeah, but what we ha- no but what we had in india mm-hmm. at that time is what we are now calling this kappa right so i mean how were more infectious it was with respect to what preceded alpha and kappa is not of interest to us isn't it no, we no, really point, worry about my point is if you do the calculation correctly it does come to close to 2.5 so compared to earlier variant the new variant when you plug in these numbers correctly you get 2.5 times about 2.5 times so well okay so do we think of it as some kind of a maximum likelihood estimate or what's no, the right way to think about it no right now it's it's much more cruder than that it's much <laughs> than, yeah, yeah. so each scenario takes 10 and a half 12 hours to do so yeah we and we are working against time doing all kinds of things so you've not really got a time to do this but these are good things to do properly i think that would be great to do um, but i'll just say complete this thought exactly you know because uh, to us also this number came out of air on april 22 i had started kind of putting small tweets where we report what we are seeing so at least there's a record i had said that you know four and a half four to five times more infectious than the, the wuhan strain explains the data well and between april 22 and april 25th i found that you know uh, basically we found that we had the bug in our code in the trains we had not turned on the variant well so when we do that and we allow for infection also to happen in the trains then between 2 and 2 and a half times explain the data better so we were kind of you know groping in the dark and it so turned out which we didn't expect you know 1.7 would have been perfectly fine for us but it so turns out that number between 2 and 2 and a half when you combine all these numbers that are coming out seems to actually explain the, is what the people who are uh, you know doing clinical experiments are also coming up with but this explain the data very well that's the point here um so there's an element of curve fitting but you know what else can we do now we made some projections for second wave based upon not this particular model but we said that no matter which model you try some conclusions are invariant so the conclusions were okay the peak happens around may first week we don't talk about the size of the peak we can't estimate that but it happens on design on a variety of extensive scenarios so that's a conclusion we can make and it comes down fairly fast so by june first second week you see, you see you know the numbers substantially down so these kind of conclusions we could make along with the fact that uh, 
2.5 times uh, infectious net explains the data well. All right. Uh, so this is just an example of the kind of things that we did. So this is the case when we said that, okay, our data suggested a variety of things that the city opened um, in February 1st from 50% activity to 65% activity. But if we had instead assumed 75% activity, then we would have seen fatality charge, which looks like this red curve here. You know, the point is that this red curve has such a slope starting from uh, February that you just can't match the data with it. It doesn't match the data at all. And you can't really say that the city opened up more later because after February, March, attempt was to close the city down. There were various notifications from the government to close the, you know, to restrict movement, not to increase movement. So this kind of thing would not be able to explain this with any combination of other things. Well, based on our extensive experimentation, it, this is not a comprehensive analysis. And similarly, if you say there were reinfections, so we say, okay, you know, 10% of recovered people on February 1st uh, are, so, you know, 65% as per our model were already infected on February 1st. So uh, in the 65%, 10%, so about 6% people are now again eligible for infection. So then the pool of susceptibles increasing. Then we would see something like this, extremely, you know, again, the slope is very different and happening early on in fatality curves. Uh, th then you say, okay, maybe this reinfections happen more slowly. So we try some scenarios of that sort and you see an orange curve. It looks difficult to explain exactly the kind of curve that we saw, which is very low increasing fatalities early on, right up till end May, March. And then you see a steep increase. So the best way to ex explain that to this is just having a variant which is small, but it grows to become substantial by mid-March or so. That does a pretty good job of explaining all this. So that was our kind of numerical way of arriving at this conclusion. Okay, this was our, um, I, I should run fast. This is our curve right now for, you know, uh, percentage infection in the city. So we expect by, I guess, June 1st, about 80% of cities infected, about 70% in non-slums and 90% in slums. And you can see in the second wave, non-slums saw a much bigger rise than slums. So about half a population is assumed, estimated to be in slums and half in non-slums in Mumbai, roughly speaking. So you see, it seems to be, you know, what we did was we calibrated slums and non-slums in such a manner that we matched the July zero survey data for Mumbai. So Mumbai saw that, okay, in three wards, about 55% people in slums were infected, 15% people in non-slums were infected. So we took that as a point to match our data to. And with that, we get these kind of projections. And it seems, you know, by and large, there are many other indicators that we're not too much off. Okay, so potential third wave, so I think I should go really fast. So what do we do for third phase? We study P fatalities under varying... So our point now is we don't know what's going to happen in the near future. You know, maybe we made a mistake by becoming... By Sandeep, having, it's okay. If you need a few more minutes, just uh, go ahead and, and, and use it. So not, a, not an issue. Thank, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we, you know, maybe we should have been more kind of humble in projecting for January, February, March, because... Although, you know, maybe later people will say the Delta variant was a black swan. It, you know, it was just a rare event which just happened to happen. Nobody expected it. And it was not under real of expectations either. But certainly the narrative in India was very different. It was as if the infection is winding down, that we have reasons to, we are heavily infected and we have reasons not to get further infected. And nowhere in the world people were telling us that, you know, variant that infective can show up in India. Uh, so but in any case, now we've learned that, so we're not going to make a projection going forward. We're just going to do scenario analysis. What if this happens? What if that happens? So we'll create some plausible scenarios. And then, then what do we, then what can happen? This gives insights onto what factors to watch out for. You know, what factors are important in the potential third wave. And it gives you a sense of, okay, if these things were to happen, what will the numbers look like? So you see some chart of scenarios, and then you can project from there as to, you know, if you think this is where we might end up then, you know, what's the, uh, what's the medical resources needed. And what I'll do is I'll just put, show peaks here. I don't want to clutter with too many graphs. I'll show you peaks and, you know, because peaks is a good measure of healthcare facilities needed. So, so time of newer variant initiations or reinfections are, again, hard to predict how they're happening. You know, many reports say that reinfections are mild now. But, you know, in our scenario analysis, as a worst case, we'll assume they'll happen on June 1st for convenience. This was done a few weeks ago. As per our model on June 1st, around 20% of population is susceptible. So as per our guess, about 80% of Mumbai has been infected and 20% is susceptible on June 1st. And amongst 20% susceptible, about 10% have been vaccinated. I mean, 10%, a little more than that, have received one dose, and then a smaller percentage have received two doses. Okay, this is our main slide for uh, the third wave. 
On 2020 June, we saw a peak fatality of plus 100. These are reported fatalities. On May 2021, we saw a peak fatality of around 90. Now we do this extensive analysis of scenarios. There are 40 scenarios that we've considered. So first is vaccine effectiveness of 30% and extensive coverage of vaccination. So vaccine effectiveness is low. It could be that, okay, vaccines are not working or maybe there's a variant that is breaking through the vaccine-provided immunity. So you give a sense of what happens in that scenario. This is vaccine effectiveness of 0.75 and again, extensive coverage. Extensive coverage means that Mumbai reaches a level of, you know, maybe one lakh uh, uh, doses uh, per, per day in the coming months. And vaccine effectiveness is 0.95. This is what we've been hearing and extensive coverage. And then we have vaccine effectiveness of 0.75 again and very extensive coverage. So we get to the level of two lakh doses a day, which is what our commissioner has promised us. But, you know, there's a scarcity of vaccines. So even if we can do it, we don't have the vaccines. Nonetheless, the picture is that in the worst case kind of scenario, now in this particular scenario, what do we have? R equal to 0% means no reinfections. So 20% of people are susceptible. Okay, you know, 10% have been vaccinated. The remaining 18% are still unvaccinated. 5% uh, reinfections. So suddenly amongst the 80% pool of people who, are, uh, uh, who have recovered, 5% are amenable to infection. And we are assuming that they'll get infected as if they were never infected before. So we're ignoring mild, mild infections, for example. They follow the same disease progression as the other guys, as the susceptible people, uninfected people. And you can think of this 5% as also that maybe our model was wrong when we said 80% have been infected. Maybe it's a smaller number. So then this 5% brings it down to a, uh, you know, something like 75%. And this is for 10% people who suddenly are amenable to reinfection. So what you see, and then within this, you have three cases. Well, so this orange bar here is no reinfections, but people become very lax. So then what are you going to see? This gray bar is no reinfections. Uh, people are not that lax. They are cautious. Uh, and we can you know, go into details, but I won't uh, go come to it maybe later. This yellow bar is, okay, now you have further uh, new variant, which is 50% more infectious than the Delta variant. So 3.375 times more infectious than the previous uh, variant. Here I'm assuming Delta variant is 2.25 times more infected. So, you know, but what you see is that the new... The number of infections due to the variant, if it's only 50% more infectious, are not going to be that much anymore. So that's less of a concern per se. Bigger And the blue curve is if that variant also happens to be 50% more virulent. Now, there's some data to suggest that the Delta variant itself is very virulent, but we're missing it. So we'll have to incorporate that in our model. We've not done that so far. Uh, but with all of this, you see in the worst case, first of all, what's really affecting things is reinfection. So one has to be very careful about watching reinfections, people getting reinfected because immunity from previous infection has gone down or you have a variant which can break through the previous in, uh, immunity from previous infections or from vaccines. So those are things to watch out for. We should have indicators which are looking out for these numbers. You know, whenever you begin to see a sign there, that's when you start to clamp down. Other messages, okay, even in this <coughs> reasonably pessimistic scenario, you see something which is order of second wave, the peak. So that tells you that, okay, at least in cities which are highly infected, like Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, you know, one should maybe, you know, under plausible scenarios, you know, one should not expect the second, the third peak to be, even in plausible worst case scenario, one should not expect the third peak to be worse than the uh, second peak. So you need just that much of infrastructure. Now, these are numbers under when vaccines become more infective. So you see that vaccines do help, but probably not as much as one was hoping for. And that's because, you know, right now with 80% of infected people, you're giving most of your vaccines to people who are already infected, so who already have some kind of immunity. So the bang for the buck right now is not so much. Over time, they are going to help. So let's illustrate this point. Now, this is the fatality projections in a world, in a good world, where there are no new infections, no new reinfections, or reinfections are very mild. They don't really lead to serious, severe outcomes. And uh, where there's a no, no new significant variant, which is much more infectious than the, uh, than the ones that exist. So any new variant is about the same uh, of infectiousness. In that case, what you see is, you know, we are matching this very well up till now. Uh, you see in this setting that if the vaccination is poor, then you still start seeing a peak, you know, a wave starting essentially around August, August uh, to August uh, second week. And this wave, uh, it will be of, you know, mild wave. But if you have strong vaccination, then you'll barely notice anything. 
it won't be that much. So that's basically it's saying that you see a small wave in that scenario, and with vaccination will play a role, and even that small wave will be quite small. So that's the message to take from here. Otherwise, numbers are, are can be difficult to rely upon. All right, now let me move on to the key drawback the, of the simulation. It takes very long. That's why we can't do all this stochastic optimization, this matching of data really well, you know, in a comprehensive manner. So computer time taken to run the city um, is large. So can a smaller city with same home, school, workplace structure give us the correct answer? Okay, so let me just give you some pictures. So this is naive scaling of the model. So you say to yourself, okay, I'll run a one million city and whatever answers I see, I'll bump them up by, uh, in this case, you know, one million cities. So Mumbai is 12.8 million cities. So I'll bump them up by a factor of 12.8. So this is the, the orange curve is the scaled version. You know, you have the 1 million city and you just burped up the answers fatalities. This is cases actually by 12.8. And the blue curve is the actual 12.8 million city. And you see that they, they agree early on, although you don't see it here, but the orange curve is more noisy. But later on, the orange curve underestimates. It has a, a smaller, flatter peak than the, the blue curve. And that's because, you know, Initially, about the same number of people are getting infected, but as a proportion, they're larger in the in a smaller city. So in a smaller city, you start having lesser infection because there's a lot of double kind of hitting. You know, your infected people are hitting already infected people. So they're not infecting as many people as you are in a bigger city. So that's the that's the essential reason the structure that's going on. That's the difference between the two. This picture is interesting. So here, by the way, I should mention, I started this blue city with um, 128 infections, because we've generally been starting cities with 100 infections. There are good reasons to do it that way, but I can discuss that later. While the, the scale city, the orange city, I started with 10 people. Right, So that's a difference. The starting states are different. Uh, starting numbers are different. Now, if I were to bump these numbers, so I start the blue, the bigger city with 1,280 people early on, randomly distributed, and I start 1 million city with 100 pe uh, people early on infected. Right? So again, they are scaled in the right manner, but now the numbers are larger. And then you see a much, much better fit. It's more or less going in the, you know, uh, exactly matching, except there's a small mismatch on the peak. And this mismatch also goes away. If I start with 1,000 people in 1 million city and 12,800 people in the, uh, in the larger city, then it's a perfect match here. So basically what it's pointing to is that you reach the mean field phase. That they're both moving in a deterministic manner. The proportions are exactly rising in a deterministic manner. So one is just a scaled version of the other. Right? And this is another graph which is insightful. That if I start both these cities, small city and big cities, with 100 infections early on, the same number of infections, then you see exactly the same evolution. Because what's going on? These 100 people are well distributed in this city. They see the same structure in the household, uh, in the schools, the workplaces. Community also, the, the amount of infection coming is, is about the same to them because it's coming from the same number of people who are infected in the community, which is very small. So you see in this case that the numbers are exactly identical between them for about 35 odd days. And then they start to deviate. So the two cities, smaller city and big city, actually move identically because it's, they're just well-separated population. So size of the city does not matter in this setting. Okay, so how do we analyze this? So we build the asymptotic regime, and as with any reasonable idea, you find eventually that other people also have also done something similar. I mean, not quite, but you know, at least this idea of asymptotic regime was already there. This was, of course, you know, expected, I guess. So Ball and Donnelly and the references there in 1995, we discovered this uh, a few weeks ago. But the regime is as follows. We'll have a sequence of systems in asymptotic regime indexed by n, the number of people in the system. So we'll let n go to infinity. Household, school, workplace structure is independent of N. So when we go from 1 million to 13 million, the house sizes are not going to change in distribution. Workplace sizes are not going to stay in the change in distribution. So the number of houses, number of workplaces are going to increase linearly with N. Communities remain the same. The number of communities we'll assume are the same, but their population will increase linearly with N. Their impact early on on susceptible individuals. So community size is going to be large, and the amount of infection that they bring to each individual who interacts with the community is, you know, it's not going to be that sensitive to N because N is going to change in a small manner early on. So that's something to be kept in mind. You know? Because it's going to, you know, the number of people infected early on is going to be sublinear, but the number of people who are susceptible is linear. Uh, okay, so now multi-type branching process. So we'll model this as a multi-type branching process. Right now we are assuming it's a finite type. So for people who know, 
Type just means, so branching process for students who are new to this goes back to Francis Galton. He was trying to model how populations evolve. So you have a parent who has random number of children, say Poisson, random number, let's say two on average. Each child, after some time, has again on average two number of people and this tree propagates. And multiple type means that you don't have one type of children, but you have two types of children, or multiple types of children. So you have a happy parent, you can have happy children and you can have sad children. And sad children, somehow, this is a picture I could find from the net. <laughs> That's, it's, uh, it's not my design. Uh, ha only have sad children. <laughs> Well, happy children can have happy children as well as sad children. But, you know, multiple types. So that's how we model things. Uh, so MIJ is the MIJ, you know, the expected number of type J offspring of single type I particle in generation. Right? So in one time period, uh, type I, how many offspring does it have of type J? So it's a matrix of these things. It's a non-negative matrix, expected number of uh, uh, offsprings. So maximum perum for obenious eigenvalue divided by rho. It has to be greater than one for infection to grow, so it must be greater than one for our setting. So m to the power n, this matrix basically, how does it grow? It essentially goes exponentially. Uh, so it's rho to the power n into something which is a constant. So u is basically your left eigenfunction of this matrix, and b is the uh, right uh, eigenvalue uh, corresponding to the parent, uh, eigenvector corresponding to the parent for obvious eigenvalue of this matrix. So you get this structure basically. You know, initially, in the branching process the population basically goes, that's all we really need to know. Initially, population grows exponentially in a branching process. So for our city, that means initially you have some infections which are isolated. So they are all going to infect the same number of people probabilistically everywhere. There's no interaction between them. So the city will, infections will evolve as a branching process. That's all we are saying. Right, um, so multi-type branching process. Uh, so vector Zn denotes the number of particles of each type at time n. So Zn, you know, so this is a result just from branching process. The number of particles of each type is going to grow exponentially. Uh, and this V is again that left eigen uh, function that I had shown earlier. And W is a random variable, which is kind of telling you that the um, overall growth is going to be random. That depends on kind of probabilistically how things evolve early on. But uh, that being random, all the, all the people in each type are going to grow exponentially with same random factor affecting all of them because they interact with each other. So this is the result from branching process. But the big thing is that the proportions of different types, Zn's are going to, you know, Zn1, Zn2, Zn3, as a fraction, they are going to stabilize. You know, because when you take the fraction, this W goes away. So what you see is that population is, so just to, for simulation, we'll divide the population in, in groups of size order one. So we'll assume that the groups are going to linearly increase as our n increases, particles are order n in number. Each group has individuals who interact with each other at home, schools, workplaces, within the group. Groups themselves can be in various states, and all possible group configurations are types for us. Groups interact with the remaining population in communities and public transport. So they, they otherwise are amongst themselves, but then they engage with the rest of the city through uh, communities and through trains, etc. Groups are, uh, okay. Till time 1 minus epsilon times log n, and this can be defined further, upon log rho, Infected people essentially meet only susceptibles in community and public spaces at, uh, at public transport. So if you're an infected person, you go to the community, you see mostly susceptible people, few uh, infected people, but the infected people are so small that you can ignore them from your analysis till this much time. And then there'll be a phase change. So you get a result like this, that ith type of people at time n, when you look at the proportion, that's going to converge to this, this ratio of this uh, eigenfunction values uh, uniformly over this time period up to this uh, time in the branching process, in the branching process of the gene. So when we get this result in probability. Here Zn denotes the number of particles of e if each type at uh, time n. These are learned, so I've said this already. After some time, infected group proportions are maintained. So population goes exponentially, but the relative proportions are being maintained. So that's good to know. Uh, and actually, this is a deterministic quantity. It's not even sample part dependent. In this regime, proportion of groups uh, completely susceptible is asymptotically one till this time period. All right. And thereafter, so I won't have time to go through the math, but thereafter, you can show that, you know, there's a mean field behavior is what population is following. So this is the empirical distribution of n people at time t. And this is the empirical distribution of n people at time, uh, at, of n people at time t minus one. And they have this nice relationship. The error terms are too small because a lot of people have been infected. So error, error terms are negligible as n goes to infinity. 
So basically, your overall growth is more or less deterministic in the model with a random starting state. So initial at time zero, for us, the time zero is going to be log epsilon n upon log rho. That's when the branching process regime ends and the mean field regime we're going to follow. Uh, so in that time, the distribution is going to converge, the initial distribution. And once that converges, you can iteratively show that uh, you know at each time period thereafter, you're just going to go for order one time period thereafter. You're going to have this convergence of uh, actual empirical distribution to mean field distribution. All right, so that's a big picture. Let me just show you. So now, just some comments. So empirical distribution converges to a limiting process mu t. Number of infected at time t in system of size n is approximated by. So mu t is the mean field distribution at time t. So number infected is just some function of that, right? You just look at each and every type and find out how many are infected in that. And then you multiply it by n. So these are proportions, and then you multiply by n. And then you get the number which are infected in your uh, simulation model at time t. Now, what we do is we have a larger system of size n2. So this mu t we approximated by mu t n1 for the smaller system. One million model gives us a pretty good idea of what this empirical distribution looks like. We compute this and we multiply by n2, and that gives us an approximation for what happens in the larger system. And that works quite well. Uh, initially, we just use the simulation output from the smaller model, because smaller model and the bigger model are moving identically early on. Thereafter, we, after a well-chosen time, we do this. So what do we do exactly? So this is the case where on day 35, one million model has, so in this case, we're looking at number of infections, how they're evolving. So in day 35, one million model has about 50,000 infections. Now we ask ourselves, in a smaller model, what would be the, you know, in the scaled version, what would be the uh, time period at which you see the same number of infections, you know, the scaled number of infections? So... 50,000 infections for in 1 million model are same as 50,000 infections for 12.8 million model at this time because they're moving together. On day 21.5 in the smaller model, we see 50,000 divided by 12.8 infections. So the if you were to scale that number, because they are both in deterministic regime, now that's an argument I've not made, but that can be made. The smaller model is going to grow deterministically. So whatever you see here thereafter, if you just scale it by 12.8, you'll match the bigger model. So what we do is we go back to 21.5 days. See, the initial distributions are changed. We are the same. We have a theorem there. The initial distributions are approximately the same here. So we take the path from then on, that's 21.5 day, and append it to day 20, day 35. And so this is what I've done here. The blue curve is the larger model actually under no intervention scenario. And the orange curve is the smaller model with this shift and scaled uh, uh, adjustment. And you can see that they're both identical, more or less, in this setting. Now, what can go wrong is that you may have interventions. So, for example, home quarantine may be activated on day 40 in our simulation model. So then on day 35, again, we see in our 1 million model that uh, it had 50,000 infections. We again go to day 21.5 and find the corresponding point in the smaller model, which has uh, you know, 50,000 upon 12.8 number of infections. So that's going to move deterministically and match our bigger model. But you know, we know that in a bigger model, after five days, you're going to have an intervention. So then uh, after 21.5 days, the smaller model, on 26.5 days, we have an intervention. So we restart our simulation. So now it's shift, scale, and restart on 26.5 days. So we exactly, we, we you know, uh, include the intervention at that time. And now you see, again, the two models are exactly matching. All right, uh, this is in a larger setting, which is a realistic setting where we do all kinds of, uh, you know, lockdown is there, opening up is there, partial opening up is there, and we see we get a pretty good match. All right, I think uh, I've taken too much of time, but it's five seconds. It's like it's interesting for uh, it's not hard of other people, any infection infects other people. You actually see after some time, both slums and non-slums had this more or less the same RT throughout after August uh, uh, 2020. They're exactly matching. Their um, you know, prevalence is not matching, but RT for them is matching thereafter. So it's a very interesting phenomena. Needs to be studied further theoretically. Okay, with this, I'll end. Thank you for allowing me more time. Thank you, uh, Sandeep, for a wonderful talk. And uh, it's all right. You did not, did not take too much uh, extra time here. We started late anyway, so. Okay, yeah. okay good. Yeah. Uh, okay, any quick questions or comments before we move to the next talk? 
All right, so let's thank uh, Professor Juneja for a wonderful talk here. Uh, yeah, so Professor Imar Srinivasan has a, has a question, I think. Yeah, please go ahead. Professor Srinivasan. Yeah, I guess I lost him here. Uh, the, uh, today also, unfortunately, we're having a few glitches. Some people are not able to unmute their mics. Uh, yes, people are giving guest privileges. So uh, I request you all, uh, please uh, use our Google form for our day two speakers. So if you're unable to accommodate your questions now, at the least we can forward them to the speakers and uh, hope it's time to revert back to us. Apologies for the glitches. Uh, over to Professor Bose. Okay, uh, then uh, thanks again, uh, Sandeep, for uh, agreeing to give a talk here. It was a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, so let's move to the uh, uh, second talk of today. Uh, the speaker is Professor Sasi Kumar Ganesan. He is the chairman of the Department of Com Computational and Data Sciences at the Indian Institute of Sciences. So there is uh, one more IISC connection here. Uh, Sandeep talked about uh, his work with Rajesh, who is also from uh, IISC. Uh, uh, Professor Ganeshan is working on developing models that use uh, multidimensional equations for predictions of different aspects of pandemics. So I, I look forward to this talk because it, it, it will talk about, uh, I hope, uh, uh, on differential equations in, in many dimensions. Uh, uh, so he said the title of his talk is uh, Spatial Temporal Modeling of COVID-19 IISC Model. Uh, over to Professor Ganeshan. Okay, I think finally he has success in, uh, okay, welcome Professor Ganesan. Uh, we can't hear you, so maybe your mic is muted. Am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. My slides are visible? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and also for um, providing the opportunity to share our research work in the direction of COVID modeling. And this is a joint work with Dr. Supramani, my colleague um, in the Department of Computational and Data Sciences. So in this presentation, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, first I will go over the um, overview of a computational models and especially the type of model, why do we need uh, computational models? And then I will talk about the, the PDE-based model that we have developed for uh, the um, COVID uh, projections. And then I will a little bit talk about the, um, the numerical scheme that we have used to solve this PDE model, because when you talk about the PDE model, then obviously the, the dimensionality um, curse comes into the picture, especially when you talk about the high dimensional PDEs. And then I will briefly summarize the results uh, before concluding my talk. Okay. So moving on, uh, in terms of the uh, COVID modeling, and we all know, thanks to the COVID impact, that uh, what is the consequences of the COVID and why we really talk about the COVID um, in a big way, right? It's it's clear. And the 
concept of uh, pandemic is also clear um, even even if you do not did not learn this before what is the difference between endemic epidemic and pandemic uh, we all um, know now um, again the impact of the covid has taught us all these lessons about uh, the different pandemics and so on so here the whole purpose of um, the modeling comes into the picture why do we need the projections and so on right uh, when we look into it all these uh, topics comes under the subject of epidemiology and epidemiology of course when you talk about epidemiology it's not only about the mathematical modeling it studies about the analysis of distributions and when who and where and the pattern distributions and especially the the public um, health interventions healthcare workers all these uh, things are policies and everything comes under the epidemiology so sometimes epidemiology is also used as a um, um, statistical tools or i would say that for the um, analytics and analysis both are um, used in the epidemiological field and in order to do the ana analytics especially especially when you want to do the forecasting what we really need is the more often mathematical models in order to do the projections and obviously um, we need a different skill set in order to um, do the projection or in order to analyze the data or even in order to um, understand the the outcomes of the uh, projections that what we really need is we need the the team of experts from epidemiology modelers data scientists and so on so that's the reason this subject especially when you're talking about the covid modeling we really need um, it is an interdisciplinary subject we need an expert from all different disciplines so going back uh, in general when you talk about the mathematical modeling of course here we are talking about uh, the time series and the time dependent problems or if you go to the scientific community so you are having a some dynamical process and then the objective is to model this uh, dynamics using a differential equations it could be an ordinary differential equation or uh, could be a partial differential equation especially if we want to include more uh, dynamics or the more independent variables into the picture or into the model so what happens basically we see the process and then we are try to understand how to um, emulate this process um, or describe this process by in terms of a differential equations and then we write it in terms of the models and then write it in terms of differential equations develop numerical scheme if the problem is simple enough you can apply the analytical methods to solve and do the estimates and the projections um, in future so based on that you can act on it and then you can derive the um, the conclusions uh, what would happen and so on so the complexity of the mathematical model and the, even the uh, projections or the dynamics depends on what we are in really interested in for instance you can do several models with even with the system of odes and if you want to go like a very complex model we have seen in the graph based or network based models also can be used i will come in a minute about um, the classifications of uh, mathematical models for infectious disease so before going that uh, one needs to understand um, about why do we really need mathematical models for uh, infectious disease um, of course when you talk about the infectious disease it's not just about the numbers and we do not want to like uh, scare mango right uh, especially the news um, uh, agencies newsmaker or twitter right it is not the purpose of just posting the messages okay this many cases and so on but it's uh, it should have or it's supposed to have um, other uh, um, reasons as well why do we really need mathematical models so especially in order to um, why we need the first point is about of course we really need it to, in our, the projections in order to frame evidence based um, non intervention or non pharmaceutical intervention policies um, like lockdowns unlocks um, all these things or even the pharmaceutical interventions or the treatments oxygenated beds especially the preparedness of infrastructure um, we really need uh, uh, the mathematical projections and uh, again when you talk about it it's not only about the treatment and policies even um, while doing the uh, sampling vaccination all these things uh, we really need the scenarios we need the forecast and unless otherwise we have the forecast we will not be able to um, otherwise we will be having to um, define or uh, make the policies randomly that might not be um, suitable uh, or might not be efficient and effective enough to contain them prevention so uh, to contain the uh, spread so um, if this is the case then the question comes uh, what do we expect from the mathematical models um, is it just a number okay how many cases we are going to get and maybe like in 3 months we are going to have peak or or just a number or um, or do we really need a more insight into the project predictions so for instance if we get the infected population 
not only the number but uh, in time and location in age uh, age of infection age of severity if you get all these um, infected populations uh, in the distribution of these um, parameters or these variables or these uh, internal coordinates we call it so then this will be more insightful in order to frame the policies especially for example if the severity uh, impact index or the infection severity less than the threshold value they might not really need the hospitalization so the these type of informations are really needed not only just the number the similarly the age of infection is also one of the factors um, very key for example how to define the recovery or how who really needs what would be the anticipation how can we anticipate like how many are going to come and so to the hospitals and all these things so we need the information um, into the dis population infected population in terms of all these uh, internal and many more and especially um, if you want to have like a long term uh, forecast uh, especially um, we really want to know like when could be the next wave or will there be a next wave if so how uh, severe it will be and how when will be the peak all this information so these are the the objectives of the mathematical model apart from um, the other um, reasons um, the other wrong reasons what we are seeing in the media so um, in terms of uh, when you talk about uh, the... mr ganeshan uh, just one quick question for you sure See, you know, you're talking to policy makers who are doing 200 things and they don't want to see an elaborate chart of information. They want to get the big picture right. Correct. So I don't think you should denounce uh, kind of, you know, summary big picture that also communicates the right information that also has a lot of value. You know, Correct. both of these things are important. which just want to put them in perspective. Exactly. I, I'll come to you in a minute. Um, especially when you talk about the, the modeling, um, the insight should be the prediction should have all these insights, but if you're going to go to the policy makers, the summary or the what could be the, the, the key points should go into the policy makers. Table. So in, in order to do the modeling, um, I would say that these are in, important, but when you go to the policy makers, we have to summarize and put the results in a summarized format. Okay, so um, in terms of the challenges, any mathematical model, right? It doesn't matter if it's infectious disease or even the scientific computing. Um, the main, the major uh, problem is the um, does all uh, mathematical model capable of achieving these objectives? Um, that's the first question. Then, if it is so, then then there should be an only one model. There cannot be many models. And the question is whether we are building a mathematical model for data analysis or for data analytics, and both are completely different topics. Um, so data analysis is more about um, getting insight from the data, from the existing data, whereas more um, data analytics is about using these informations, uh, doing the projections. And uh, whether the, um, the model that we are working on, whether it's capable of handling uncertainty in the data or what happens if there are unknown unknowns, for example, the new variants, so that new variants nowhere in the existing data, whether the model is able to incorporate these new uh, variants or several other unknown unknowns into the model or whether there can be an uh, uncertainty regions, um, projections and so on. That's where the scenario analysis comes into the picture. And also whether the model is capable of, because when you talk about the infectious disease, especially the COVID, um, we are also talk, uh, heavily talking about uh, the social distancing, interactive index, uh, travel, and so on. So all these um, key factors um, should be incorporated or the model should accommodate all these um, key factors into the uh, model. So whether we can do that or not. So on the other hand, um, this is what uh, we know from the scientific community, right? So if we know if you, you torture the data enough or long enough, it will confess to anything, right? And um, this is clear. So that's the reason why no mathematical model, right? Uh, this picture comes into the picture role, right? All mathematical models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, we have to agree to that. Um, no mathematical model is perfect, and uh, we, because every mathematical model has some assumptions and limitations, and this uh, we have to keep in mind when you're trying to build um, mathematical models or even the the true model for um, scenario plannings. For example, this is our view. Um, in order to build a national model, what we really need is we really need to have like a different setup uh, or we call it as a platform it could be different uh, named as different for example the data platform is it should be started from the data collection that the coordinated data collection is missing or might be doing and unfortunately it is not shared with epidemiologist or might be has shared but unfortunately uh, it is not shared with modelers so we have tried with several other sources also and we have been denied um, that's the fact. Uh, I do not know about the other modeling groups. Um, at least from IAC, we have tried a group of people have tried it, did not work. 
and um, even even to in order to uh, have a sin um, models what we really need is first we need to design the scenarios what would happen if, including the experts inputs from the expert from epidemiologists health workers modelers policy makers so because whatever we are doing nowadays is okay whatever the our intuitions individual uh, modelers intuition says okay I, what would happen if this is the case right this is how we build the scenario but it need not be a practical it need not be applicable nationwide it is different for state wide so that's the reason first we need to define the scenarios that's why first defining the problem statement itself um, should be coordinated unfortunately i don't think we are doing it in india and the next comes the forecast platform and this is also somehow mismanaged for example in order to have the forecast what we really call it as an ensemble forecast this is what we really need we know that no model is perfect and no model is of course is not um, is not going to give the exact projections what we really need is an ensemble of uh, forecasts um, and what we really need is uh, we should collect all the independently developed forecast from different models for different scenarios and create an ensemble forecast for example this is a classical example of cdc in us um, this is how exactly they are doing so they collect 10 15 20 um, um, forecast models are the forecast from different modelers and then ensemble it and then once you ensemble it then you will classify it very short term forecast or a long term forecast and then you define then uncertainty regions it's where um, the 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 power of the uh, ensemble comes into the picture and then based on that of course the policy makers need not go into the details of the ensemble forecast insights of the data and so on but based on that what's a summary goes into the policy platform is a uh, more um, important for to um, define or to make evidence based policies and planning uh, to handle the worst case scenario so this is how we feel that okay the uh, the national model should work but unfortunately um, this is an not happening and then it did not um, go in the similar way the same um, the, on the other hand what is happening in india is of course uh, there are many many models um, when we do the literature survey one come one will come to know exactly the like more than 20 25 models and i would say that there are each and if you look at each and every model there are really excellent models many models are really excellent models are very powerful and each and under each um, account so what does it mean it is um, just blaming the modelers uh, and saying that okay modelers did not predict and did not inform us is just like a ship code um, so it's just a like blame game i would say so first of all there is no policy of how to handle the data how to do the forecast what they really the policy makers are expecting there is no uh, system in, in place and no ensemble of predictions is used or encouraged for modeling in india a no well thought out uh, framework for ensemble forecast i don't see any uh, platform which that supports that and also may, ma, some of the i'm not saying that all but some of the um, analysis papers are the modeling confused with the analysis for analytics uh, both are completely different and no data rather than this covid model i think this is true for um, almost all mathematical modelers at least this is what um, i have been informed um that uh, other than the crowdsourcing um, platform there is no data available for the modelers in order to do the any projections instead of uh, doing all these corrective measures modelers are um, blamed unfortunately and this is uh, really a pity um, this might happen only uh, here this is very unfortunate and modelers are asked to give um, the explanations and i think this is um, uncalled for i would say okay so maybe i will also be called for um, such a no notice but uh, that's okay i can do that um, saying that um, so now i will move on to the mathematical modeling this is about the the policy making and so on so going into the mathematical modeling part um, so we can classify the existing models or the, the all uh, models of in infectious diseases into four categories um, first one is the compartment model this we have seen in the previous uh, talks and as well as the next talk we are going to see the compartment model so, and then agent based model network models we have seen already the time series models about the uh, moving average simple aggressive and so on each and every of, uh, one of these models are having um, advantages and disadvantages as i mentioned before one has to keep in mind that no model is perfect uh, including the model of uh, pde there are several advantages and disadvantages and that's the reason why uh, we are um, emphasizing on um, ensemble of uh, forecast so again i want to reiterate that um, the all models are wrong and but some models are useful we have to um, keep in mind and build our um, system or the platform in such a way that um, so that um, we get the right projections or the answer with uncertainty so that uh, we will be able to handle the pandemic in a better way 
So going into the modeling part, uh, I'm not going to spend much time. This uh, we have seen it several times. SIR model, the very basic models as in yesterday's talk also, we have seen uh, how this SIR model has been built and in a detailed way it has been presented. I will skip this SIR model. And there are variants of SIR models available and in, keep on including the compartments. Uh, basically, when you include the compartment, keep on including, increasing the compartments, you will be able to capture uh, different uh, features into the model. And the main advantage, I would say, um, of these um, SIR and the variants of SIR model is it's a very simple and straightforward model, but it's still um, capable of uh, doing a lot of um, wonderful job. Um, so in terms of the projections and other thing, if you are having the right data and if you are having the right fitted R0 and so on, other parameters, this model works uh, exceptionally well. So we should make use of it. This is like a less cost effective models, uh, but at the same time, so we talked about um, whether this um, the outcome uh, from these models just like a number, but of course one can keep on increasing the compartments and get more insights, but uh, there is a limit to it. We cannot infinitely increase the compartment. If this is the case, um, just having the number is enough. Um, is it enough to have like uh, non um, pharmaceutical interventions like uh, lockdown and unlock strategies or even to host, uh, the infrastructure needs and so on? How to interpret all these things? Is this enough uh, with this model? Um, of course, um, it's not. Um, nothing is uh, enough. We need more and more information, insights. And that's where the different models comes into the picture. And the previous talk we have seen, it's like the, the I would say it's a very effective and then um, very insightful models, but one criticism we always get is the computationally expensive. That's no, of course, nothing is free. If you want more insights, um, one has to pay uh, the cost. And this is how the modeling world works. So our idea is to come um, to propose in between these two, instead of going like individual agent-based uh, model on all the ODE models, like a compartment models, uh, what's an intermediate between, but at the same time, you are trying to capture uh, the information that we are really needed for um, um, the projections uh, needed for the policy making and so on. So that's how we come up with the PDE model. The PDE model, this is a six dimensional PDE model, uh, three, um, two in space and time uh, plus one, and then uh, each internal coordinate, we call it like uh, the one internal coordinate is um, the age of the infection, and the second is the day, the age of the population, and the third is the severity of the infection. So that's each of these three um, variables are considered as an independent variable. Then the P I will show it in a minute how the PDE will look like. It's basically the population balance model, but in customized for the um, pandemic or infectious disease. So this is how the, the overall uh, model uh, workflow will be. For example, in the model, we have to provide the active cases of vaccinated population. Um, when you start the simulation, when you start the uh, model, you have to provide the information about the antibody and the antibody weaning uh, if you're having um, in, if you're having any models. And this goes as an initial values. And then, of course, the six-dimensional PDEs. And we use a finite element scheme. I will a little bit talk about the numerical scheme. I will not go into the detail. But using these numerical scheme, then it goes into the um, time watching. When it go to the time watching, of course, um, uh, one has to um, understand how it is implemented. It is implemented in such a way that how the vaccination uh, drive has happened so far. So, for example, um, in the implementation, we have done it age-wise distribution of infections from 0 to 11 and 12 to 17 and so on. There are five categories of age-wise distribution, but there will be an interaction from among all to all. There is no separate uh, ODE or PDEs. It's a single PDE, but it, inside it is having the information about uh, different age uh, age groups. And this is how the workflow goes. Um, you, you update first the spatially. When you talk about the spatial, um, it, it includes the recovery and the deceased and also the people movement from one place to the other place. And the second comes about the abduction in the, um, the, the age of infection and the age of population and then the age of uh, and the um, severity of the infection. So that's how the each um, independent direction it will get update. And once the update is done, then the model takes into the consideration of this uh, distribute uh, antibody uh, it will be distributed using a viable distributions and then it is updating the um, antibody weaning if, the, if it is included in the model of course we have included in the model and then include the vaccination because then it has to take care of the susceptible population and then introduce the immune escape uh, new variants it could be immune escape or even the uh, the um, escape the vaccination also so 
this is done um, in this the model and uh, we are by providing by these are the levers of the model so by changing the levers we will be able to do this different scenario analysis using the the model so this is just one picture of uh, the output of the model for example if you get an um, this is like a snapshot at a particular time instances uh, for example at a given time instances you will be getting the distribution of the infected people over the patient age and then the covid infections uh, severity as well as the the age of the infections at every time step um, so this is again in terms of the space and so on you will be able to get the um, information so how the mathematical model looks like um, of course the time t is the time t infinite is the final time that uh, until when we want to compute and then we have the space uh, two dimensional that is we denote it as omega x and then these are the spatial and the time uh, domain and as an internal coordinate or the internal domain we are having three um, internal variables as i mentioned early like one is about the age of the population and another is about uh, on the age of the infection and the third one is about the age of the um, the day of um, the infection severity these are the three um, internal domains and the three internal variables will form the domain omega l so this is how um, then we are looking at it we are looking for the infected population i the distribution of the infected population i over the domain omega x cross uh, omega l and this distributed population will be advectored depends on different policies different nucleation and so on so this is how it looks like um, uh, in terms of the geometry if you go um, it's like uh, time and space uh, in two dimensions is the three dimensional geometry and each dimension we solve again the three internal coordinates is basically it becomes like a six dimensional pde and the pde what we are solving here is we are solving for the the infections infected people are the confirmed cases in the in the model the first term do i by dot it's a time evaluation the second term is then abduction and um, what happens if the, the people migrate from um, it's it's spatial migration um, it is not like uh, the traveling from one place to another place traveling from one place to another place is, um, are modeled through f and whereas the divergence of l uh, the third term in the pde uh, defines the um, all the internal um, advections uh, for example the the nucleation hatch so nucleation b nuke is the one which happens it's an initial value problem in the internal direction b, b nuke is nothing but the new, new infections comes into the picture whereas if you compare it with the compartment model the r not um, component will come into the picture of the b nuke so in each direction it will infect and depends on the the scenarios on us to choose all the uh, parameters and based on the scenario uh, param parameters we uh, define and then solve this problem in order to get the projections so in terms of the total populations how to get it's similar to what we are seeing but only difference is that here we have the distribution not i is not an, a single discrete value it is a distribution over the space and the internal um, domains so you need to do the integral over x so what you are going to get you are going to get the um, the recovered people the recovered population and the infected population quarantine populations and then infectious death so because when you talk about the b new where the new infections comes into the picture one has to take care of the um, quarantine and so on so then question comes so how to incorporate this into the model especially how to incorporate the um, so social behaviors including the um, social distancing inter uh, interactive ind index and so on so this comes again into in terms of the b nu b nu is r times the integral over the 1 minus gamma q whereas the 1 minus gamma q is the quarantine if the gamma q equal to 0 which means no quarantine if gamma q equal to 1 it's a fully quarantines of the infected people there will be no new spread this is how it comes but then so social distancing all other parameters comes into the um, b nu through r where r is defined again with the some distributions and these distribution the parameters in these distributions are fitted with the data which are um, available in the public domains so again um, these are the different index i would say that these are the levers in order to do the scenario analysis for example the interactive in index is the one of the key parameter when you put like interactive index of 0 then everything is under perfect lockdown and then r to r goes to 0 and the second lever is the sd the social distancing index when you talk about the social distancing index when it is d equal to 1 everyone follows the partial perfect social distancing then there is no um, a uh, possibility of uh, spreading but this is not the case um, and what we are trying to do in the 
from the previous data is we fit the SD and then we make scenario analysis by varying the SD value. That means social distancing values. And in addition to that, there is a growth factor. For example, somebody got infected, whether how um, the person grows and um, the severity of the infection grows, that depends on the immunity of the infected person and then the pre-medical history of the infected person and, uh, and also the, how effective that uh, recovery and so on. But unfortunately, we do not have the data. And uh, once we get the data, we will be able to include the comorbidity and all these things into the model. Then we will come to know, like once a person got infected, we will come to know after 10 days or 15 days, what will be the infection severity of that particular person. So um, especially in the in a distributional settings, so this is the capability of model. But um, with with that really heavily depends on the data, but unfortunately we don't have the data. Again, how the infection and number density works and everything um, comes in, I'm not uh, going to the detail about um, the individual fits, um, but if you're interested, I can, um, uh, offline, I can discuss about this model and also can uh, get into the picture. So now I will briefly explain how we solve this six dimensional PDE. So because we know um, when once you have the PDE of uh, three dimensional, so all the um, numerical standard numerical schemes can be applied. But when you talk about the six dimensional PDEs, then we need a different uh, numerical scheme to handle the dimensionality um, curves and then we use this uh, splitting method, the operator splitting methods uh, to handle this dimensionality uh, crisis. How we do is um, we split it in uh, X direction and the internal directions. And when you talk about the X direction and, and the L direction, we talk about the spatial direction update first, and then we do the um, update in the internal direction. Here, the strength splitting is used um, in the finite element settings. So in a finite element settings, we solve the first the spatial uh, distribution. And once you get the update from the um, C, C includes um, our the infectious um, the rec recovery rate and then the uh, death rate. And then once that, that is updated with that I, the updated value will be goes as an initial condition to the um, internal co coordinate domain and internal coordinate domain is again a 3D. And then this is again solved um, to update the values, whatever we have seen, including the nucleation and the social distancing and so on. And then the time series continues. So this is how it is implemented. So basically the um, split the D plus one dimensional space, the D is the... Um, you are, um, in this case, it's five, uh, space two, and then the internal uh, three, so totally five plus one, six dimensional PDE, and split it into the D, um, and the one dimensional equations can be solved separately when I talk about the um, each uh, configuration. And then in terms of the finite element setting, I skip this one, this may not be interest to um, somebody is really interested how the finite element settings works, then again, I'm, I'm happy to discuss in the offline. In terms of the implementation, again, um, it is the technique with that is in our open source package and there's a couple of publications how um, the, it is, uh, the splitting is implemented in the, the, in the finite element context. Um, I uh, again refer to these papers if somebody is really interested in how to handle the high dimensional PDEs in the finite element settings, I skip this. So I'm not going to uh, give the detailed proof like what happened and whether the projections are not, um, whether we are able to project it correctly on this, uh, whether the forecast worked correctly. I request um, you to go to the web page and uh, what we do is um, we do update um, uh, every month or two months once. When we update, we still keep the old uh, projections. One can click in, uh, as a chain. You can click um, since um, last 2020, I think April or May, the first uh, release. So we can One can really go and check the uh, all releases and then one can confirm all, how the projection works. I'm not going to show anything like uh, whether we are able to uh, project it correctly or not, but one can really check it uh, with all the data projected, all the publications. So um, in terms of the um, projections, what we have done, uh, mainly we concentrate uh, for Karnataka district-wise. When you go to the India, we have done it for uh, state-wise. And of course, the capability of the model is we can really go to the district wise, taluk wise, uh, depends on the how many finite element cells that you are using. Each cell will de um, describe the, the each unit um, will describe the district or you can define it as a taluk or even you can uh, come um, further wards and so on. So that's uh, there is no end to it. This is we call it in the scientific community, right? H, H tends to zero, then you're going to the continuum case or you will be approaching to the um, continuum case. That will never happen because of the computational cost. But in the present uh, setup in the simulations, what we have done is um, we have uh, computed uh, for an uh, India, we have computed for the state-wise uh, numbers and for the Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, we have done it for, and we have done it for um, 
even the jharkhand also the district wise so district wise projection also we have um, done it and then one can go to this web page and see the different scenarios and what we are currently working on is the wave 3 uh, projection forecast and this will be the results are ready but we are doing the analysis it will be um, shared shortly um with this um again i want to summarize what we have done so a new pde model based on um the six dimensional population wells modeling is proposed for infectious disease and i would say that this is more compact compared to um the compartment models in order to get the insights and not uh, really like um i'm not saying that the compartment models with the only two or three um in compartments if you want to get as yes, in, in insight as this pde then you need to increase the number of compartments compared to that this uh, more proposed pde model is um, compact and it is efficient than agent based models that we have seen that's computationally um, it's an i would say that uh, in between these two models and what we have also developed is an operator splitting um, scheme that is um, applied to the covid model um, this we have briefly seen but so so are interested one can go into the web page and see the reference links and if you want to know about the models the forecast the projections how it is done how it has performed so i request um, you to visit the web page and then you can see the previous forecast so that you can understand whether we we were able to um, get it uh, in a right um, manner or not so with this um, i close my presentation and if there are any questions um, i will take it and thank you for uh, your attention uh <clears throat> thank you professor ganeshan for giving us an insight into your uh, multi dimensional model it was quite interesting uh, yeah i can take a few quick questions okay. i have already told the next speaker that we are running here about 10 minutes late so he'll probably join around 11:30 or so so we have enough time uh, if you have any questions for the previous speaker also uh, there is one question uh, uh, sandeep are you still there Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I got a question in the chat box. Uh, it says uh, ask the following: Has the window of opportunity between a person who has COVID and a contact being uh, con considered in this particular model? Sorry, so uh, window of a person who already has COVID and uh, and a contact maybe there is a comma here and a contact being considered in this particular model. So how are we handling people who already have COVID? So. Yeah. But the way we are handling it is in a, in a general in a standard setting we are assuming that the person who has covid has uh, is now uh, recovered and cannot be infected so they have immunity forever but then when we consider these scenarios where we allow for reinfections in that, in that scenario we are saying that okay a small percentage of them uh, you know for example 10% of people who have been recovered are now completely susceptible so that's kind of how we are handling this thing we've not really kind you know other way could have been that we say that there is a probability distribution people who got infected on a particular day after sample from some distribution maybe on average a year long with some way standard deviation out it they can they are again amenable to reinfection we haven't done that because you know we don't know how to do that correctly at all there's no point uh, it's not clear to us how to cover the distribution we thought we'll just plug in this reinfection scenarios and then see what happens from there in cyclo doctor season Does that answer your question? No. I, I guess so. Uh, so let's take a uh, one more uh, professor M R Sinivasan uh, who writes whether you are overdoing through simulation. Uh, I, I guess your point is: Are we kind of over kind of calculating through simulation? Um, I mean, that's a fair point. So one has to kind of you know figure out where simulation is uh, strong, um, where it's weak. I mean, the strength of simulation is that all of details can be modeled. So you know, in some sense, when I mentioned to you that uh, you know, uh, for a second wave, the number of conclusions we could make, which were robust to variety of scenarios, so we could observe that because we had a detailed simulation model. Now, other models are somewhat more fragile to assumptions because, but our model depends on a few big things, and uh, you can figure out things that it's robust to. So a lot of detailed calculations, which would otherwise be difficult to come up with, simulation models are useful. So it's always good to be skeptical of what you are doing and keep examining how you can reach the same conclusions more simply. Uh, but nonetheless, you know the amount of detail that we have, uh, it's one of those things which all, where all the behavior becomes deterministic later. But the only way you can evaluate that determinism is not by solving a PDE because that would be you know almost infinite dimensional. 
but through simulations, that gives you deterministic behavior more accurately. Um, so I don't see right now that there's, that there's no value to simulation, that the simulations are not useful and they can be replicated by something else. It just seems like for city level, maybe it's not that good. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Maybe I'll close the question session because I can see Professor Manindra Agarwal has joined. So thank you, Professor Ganesan, again, and thank you, Professor Jinaja, for taking those questions. So let me invite uh, uh, Professor Agarwal to give his talk. So Professor Manindra Agarwal is uh, a faculty at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and he's also the Deputy Director at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He has worked on the Supermodel Com Committee and on COVID-19 and he's one of the proponents of the Sutra model for COVID-19. So he's going to talk about uh, what else, but the COVID Sutra. Uh, welcome, Professor Agrawal. Thanks, Arup. Um, uh, just a clarification, I am no longer Deputy Director of oh, okay. my tenure last year. Okay. And that gave me time to really work on the model. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Okay. So uh, let me just share the presentation with you. Okay, so I hope this is the slide visible in the full screen. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So uh, I presume that uh, uh, the speakers who have uh, talked before me have already introduced the basics of uh, modeling of pandemic. So I'm not going to get into details of that. I just want to pick one point from the SIR model, which I'm sure have been covered already. Uh, as we know that uh, SIR model splits the population into three groups, susceptible, infected, and removed, with uh, these variables S, I, and R representing their sizes in fraction, so that the sum is one. And uh, there are these differential equations that govern the time evolution of these variables. Uh, so I'm skipping all this because I presume it's all has been discussed earlier. Uh, the one point that I want to make here is our observation is the following. Uh, if you let n of t denote the daily new infection, or the fraction of daily new infections, uh, so as time we are assuming goes in days, uh, then uh, by SIR model, then the new infection at time t is exactly beta times s times i. And uh, using the equation s plus i plus r equals 1, we can simplify it and write it as write i as 1 over beta times n plus i plus r times i. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Professor Agarwal. Yes. The slides yes. are actually not moving. If you not could moving. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's see what I need to do. Can you also go in the full screen mode? Yeah. Yeah, and let me just share the entire screen. Sometimes that is what the problem is. Okay, let me just try again. Are the slides moving now? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So I'll just quickly probably run through it again. The, in the SIR model, uh, S, I, and R denote uh, uh, time-varying quantities, which represent fraction of population in each of these three categories. So the sum is one. And we have these differential equations that govern its time evolution. Uh, if we let N of T denote the fraction of new infections that occur at time T, then uh, by the model n is beta times s times i, which can then be rewritten as i being 1 of n plus i plus r times i. Now these, remember, are fractions, uh, which means that actual numbers divided by the total population. If you clear the denominator and just represent or denote these hat quantities as the corresponding actual numbers multiplied by your the population, so P0 is the underlying population of the region of study. Uh, then uh, the same equation translates to I hat equals 1 over beta N hat plus 1 over 
P naught times I hat plus R hat times I hat. Uh, so this is really a, if you look at these three quantities, I hat, N hat, and this I hat plus R hat times I hat. Uh, uh, the SIR model says that these three quantities are linearly related. And if uh, there is a pandemic following SIR model, and we can compute or estimate these three quantities over time, then it's straightforward to extract the value of parameter beta, which is the contact rate from this equation. Uh, and that's a very useful point because uh, uh, the SIR model is just two parameters that govern the trajectory beta and gamma. Gamma actually there is a, can be estimated uh, separately. And so once we can get beta also, we can then compute the trajectory for the future as well. The problem is that uh, in general, uh, what we measure are not these three quantities because I had represent the total infections or N had required represents the uh, total infection at time T. What gets reported may not be exactly equal to this and in general may be much less. So that's why uh, one is not able to use the data to estimate the parameter values and uh, that's where epidemiologists come in and they use other methods uh, by study the property of virus, infectivity of virus, dynamics of the underlying population, and so many other factors to come up at an estimate of the parameter values. Now, moving on to the COVID-19, uh, this is a somewhat unusual pandemic. Specifically, for example, it has a very large number of asymptomatic cases which means uh, uh, since a lot large number of these asymptomatic cases never get detected, what gets reported as uh, positive cases is actually a huge underestimate of the actual number of cases. So that makes this uh, problem of you know, getting uh, uh, this estimates, correct estimates of uh, I had uh, Number currently number of infected cases, etc., much more difficult. And the second uh, major difference uh, in this pandemic has been that uh, uh, a lot of countries have actively tried to control its spread and uh, have succeeded to varying degrees. So, what that means in terms of uh, the equation that we set up is that if the pandemic is limited to a small region, then the dynamics at that point will have the underlying population as just population of that small region, not the entire country. For example, if, if you think back last year in March, April, in India, the pandemic was limited to just a few major cities, even parts of major cities. So the at that point, the dynamics really have used the population of those parts not the entire country. So, which means that to get the dynamics right of, at that time, the under, you need to even estimate the denominator, which is not no longer the total population of the country. So that, and that changes with time. That denominator is changing with time as uh, the pandemic spreads more and more regions with time. So, that's another challenge that uh, this pandemic has thrown up. Actually, it's uh, reasonably easy to address this challenge uh, if by just making the denominator, that is the population, is a function of time. And let's P of T is, if that is the population at time T, which over which the pandemic is active. And then define a new parameter rho, which is the ratio of P with P naught, the total population of the region, uh, we get that rho is a value which is between 0 and 1. And uh, it monotonically increases with time from 0 to 1. And uh, this, we have reduced this parameter, we call it the reach of the pandemic, which measures to what extent has pandemic reached the population. 
And now, of course, this creates this additional issue that uh, you have one more parameter now whose value needs to be estimated and making the life a little more difficult. Okay. The good thing about this pandemic, if at all one can call it, is that uh, perhaps for the first time we have very extensive data available uh, at district level in India. Uh, daily time series of uh, new infections, deaths, etc. So that's perhaps it gives us a hope that you know, with that extensive data, one can extract useful information from data. On the other hand, keeping in mind that uh, the number of reported cases are going to be a significant underestimate of the actual number of cases. So the big question, the challenge here is that how can one use the reported data? And ideally, one would like to use the reported data to estimate the parameter value. Because once we have the parameter values, we can then uh, model the, get the dynamics of the pandemic right. Now, of course, I have not even talked about the model that is being to be used to estimate the dynamics. But whatever the model is, every model will have some parameter values, and one would like to use the uh, reported data to estimate the parameter values. I think. So, uh, transitioning to the reported data, I'm now introducing more variables here. N sub t is uh, the fraction of daily reported cases. This is different from i, which is the fraction of daily cases. So, N sub t is going to be, uh, sorry, N sub t is not, that's n. So, N sub t corresponds to n. This is the daily reported cases, and the n is fraction of daily cases. Similarly, t of t is a fraction of reported active cases. This is a significant subset of i of t. And r sub t of t is the fraction of uh, cumulative removed among the reported cases. So again, this is a reported version of the removed cases. These are fractions, so again, multiplying them with the underlying population, which now we uh, can write as rho times p naught. We had get this corresponding hat quantities, t hat, rt hat, and nt hat. Now, these three quantities are available, as I mentioned, as daily time series, even at district level. So these are the three data points that we have, one for each every day. And the question is that uh, there is there, there is a relationship in SIR model of the actual versions of these three quantities. So is there a somewhat similar relationship between these three quantities, which is the reported version of those? And uh, we make this hypothesis uh, that, uh, in fact, there is a very similar relationship as one with the SIR model. Just to refresh your memory, that was i hat equals 1 over beta n hat plus 1 over p naught times i hat plus r hat times i hat. And the hypothesis I'm making here is that uh, t hat is some constant times n t hat plus another constant e over p naught times t hat plus r t hat times t hat. And uh, t hat is a reported version of i hat and t hat is a reported version of n hat. Mr. Agarwal, is there a physics-based uh, explanation for this relationship? I am or? coming to that. I will come to that, yes. I, right now, I'm just trying to motivate uh, a, or rather raise this question that there should be, if this property holds, what is the explanation? So the good thing about this hypothesis is that it can actually be verified. Uh, because uh, these three quantities are known for every day. So uh, choose a suitable value of b and plot this t hat minus b times nt hat against this quantity and see uh, if the hypothesis is correct and if we manage to pick the correct value of b, then these points will lie in up on a straight line passing through the origin whose slope is e over p naught. So let's look at the data that we have. Uh, start with the India data. 
um, here are these points, the same thing, T minus B times N and T times T times T hat. So the hat part is missing here because I couldn't get it. this uh, hat put up there, but it's really the hat quantities. And uh, the value of, uh, uh, as you see that these points really line are lying up nicely on a straight line. This is the data from 23rd March to 23rd April last year. Uh, B value of this is, it is 3.86, E is very large, something like 39,000 plus. And R square value of this fit is very high, 0.99. Moving on in time, uh, April 29th to June 20, nearly two months data, again, very nicely lined up on a line, but for different values of B and E. R square value still remains very high. Next, July 21 to August, that's about a month. Again, B and E value have changed. R square remains very high. Uh, September 21st to November 1st, again, you see E has now come out dramatically to 82 only. Uh, R square stays very high. November, December, again, R square remaining high. If you just keep observing B and E value, they keep changing. Uh, January, March, uh, then uh, this is the April, May days. Uh, e value has come down further. The R square value of all these fits is consistently high. For India, this this uh, equation, this, these are the observations to that whether that equation, that hypothesis equation holds or not. It turns out that it holds for about two thirds of days. In fact, if you notice, there are missing, there are gaps here. March, this ends on March 28th. And this starts on April 24th, so almost a month long gap. Those are the, there are some gaps. So for two thirds of days, this in, of the entire timeline situation works. In fact, there are nine different phases for different values of B and E for which this is. That's a very curious observation. And the immediate question is, is, is this something unique to India or is it a universal property? Turns out it's a universal property. Uh, we have done now simulations for 26 countries, all states of India, and more than 500 districts of India. Each one of them shows exactly the same thing. Uh, just to take another example, here is the US data. Uh, starting from last year, March, April, uh, again, we can notice B and E value. R square is very high. Fit is very good. May, June, this is uh, June to September, uh, October, November, November, January, February, March to May. Uh, so for the US timeline, uh, again, for about two thirds of days, this uh, equation holds. And there are now eight different phases uh, with uh, different values of B and E for each so that's very interesting. Yeah, another very interesting observation is for both India and US, if you look at the values of E across the phases, it starts very high. So in, for India, I, I didn't show phase one. The E value is actually uh, something like uh, 57 lakhs or more. Then comes out 39,900 and so on. So it dramatically reduces across phases. U.S. also starts high, not as high as India, but still reasonably high, and then it reduces the number. And then towards the end, it kind of starts converging to its own. This gives rise to the following. First, why does this equation, which I, which is, I made the hypothesis, why does it hold for majority of things? Also, why does it not hold for some things? And finally, uh, what is this meaning of this E? Uh, there is a, there is a very dramatically changing value. Uh, now, the answer to all these questions is provided by the Sutra model, which is proposed by two of us. This way, yeah. uh, so, just a quick uh, overview of the Sutra model. Uh, 
Yes, I mean, there is too much noise here. Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you are audible, but uh, your noise level has increased. Noise level increased. Oh, okay. So let's be there. Okay. Yeah, this is better, much better. Okay, fine. So, uh, in Sutra model, we divide the population into essentially four categories: uh, susceptible. Then infected but undetected, so that uh, transition is initially uh, susceptible to undetected. Then some of the undetected test positive, so that uh, gets transition into the second tested positive category. And remaining undetected eventually get removed and all tested positive also eventually get removed. So this, uh, this name sutra comes from SUTR, the first letters of these four categories, and A is for the approach. Now, uh, instead of four variables, I am now using five variables here to, to distinguish the remote from coming directly from U and remote coming from T. So these are the five variables. There's, uh, the, again, these are fractional variables. Their sum is always one. And the dynamics is pretty much similar to the SIR model with the one crucial difference. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, only those who are undetected infect others because those who test positive get quarantined and uh, generally are not going to infect others. So the change in uh, S is uh, minus beta times SU. Everybody who gets uh, from susceptible becomes infected goes to the category U. So the change in category U is beta SU comes in. And as a, a normal uh, as normally done, uh, from U, uh, gamma times U is assumed to be removed uh, from U, and then N sub T, which is a daily tested positive and detected cases, that's N sub T. So N sub T many go from U to T category. And change in T is N sub T comes in and gamma T goes out, and the change in RU and RT is scheduled. So that's the dynamics of this uh, model. So everything is here is uh, fixed except uh, how to fix n sub t or define the value of n sub t. There is a standard way here, which also uh, is done for the removed category also. The k take n sub t to be a fraction of u because it's uh, everybody who's test positive comes from the category u. However, that's uh, not a very good choice because and I'm going to argue now. Only the, the recently infected have a higher chance of getting tested positive than those who are infected earlier. And that is primarily due to the contact tracing protocol that gets adopted. So just imagine uh, how contact tracing takes place. Somebody develops symptoms, gets tested positive, and then the contact tracing of that person becomes everybody who has come in contact with that person in recent few days is tested. Some of them may test positive also. The key thing is, those who test positive through contact tracing are most likely infected by the original person who was symptomatic and got tested. So they were infected after this original person was infected. So this directly immediately biases the tested positive cases to the more recent case, coupled with the fact that generally it takes about a week, within a week somebody develops the symptoms and gets tested. So. Uh, choosing n sub t therefore to be a fraction of the entire undetected population is not such a good idea. Uh, it may be better to take uh, n sub t as a fraction of recently infected uh, population. But there is no real uh, nice way of ex uh, extracting recently infected population until we realize that beta SU represents the most recently infected population who got infected just the day before. And also add to the fact the observation that over a period of few days, the number of infected cases doesn't change dramatically. 
so we can take some constant time beta sc as a representation of the size of the recently infected population and then set m sub t to be delta times that and delta k i set to be new variable or parameter called epsilon so n sub t is taken to be epsilon beta sc this i claim is a better representation of recently uh, tested positive cases now when you plug this in uh, the analysis also comes out very nicely uh, if you just compare the equations for u and t you get uh, u prime plus gamma u is a beta 1 minus epsilon times su and t prime plus gamma t is beta epsilon su and this gives a this uh, setting epsilon had to be epsilon over 1 minus epsilon this shows that uh, e minus epsilon hat u prime is equal to minus gamma t minus epsilon hat u leading us to this uh, relationship of t being epsilon hat u plus some constant times e to the minus gamma and uh, this is a decaying exponential with time so in short period of time this can be ignored and we can assume that u has converged to t over epsilon hat in a similar way we can show that r u quickly converges to r t over epsilon hat plus some constant of integration c so this two derivations really make the life a lot easier because now we can relate these quantities u is the unknown detected case or undetected case and t are the detected cases and there is a nice relationship further Uh, going back to the formula n sub t is epsilon beta su, and now plugging in the derivations of the last slide, u is one minus epsilon times uh, sorry epsilon u is one minus epsilon times t, and then uh, substituting for s here and just simplifying, we get n sub t equals this quantity, and these are the fractions clearing the denominators, like. Uh, one gets t hat is equal to this constant times n t hat plus this constant times t hat plus r t hat times t hat, and setting b is equal to this quantity and e is equal to one over epsilon rho one minus c. We get t hat is equal to b times n t hat plus e over p naught times this quantity, exactly as hypothesized. This is the we call the fundamental sutra of the model. Relating three known quantities uh, of the of the observed uh, data through the two parameters, actually B and E are compositions of parameters. So, what are the parameters now uh, in the model? Beta is the contact rate, gamma is the removal rate, eta is mortality rate. These are same as the SIGM model. We have three additional parameters now. Epsilon is the ratio of detected to total infections, uh, because that's what uh, we our, the derivation showed. C is the constant which connects R T to R U, and rho is the reach of the pandemic, which measures what fraction of population the pandemic is currently active on. So we have in all the six parameters. Uh, How do we get uh, hold of these parameters? Well, uh, gamma, eta are straight away to calculate. So I'll just uh, not bother about it. From the mortality rate and removal rate, you can directly compute this. In fact, gamma we are going to fix to point one because uh, reporting uh, of removal is uh, uh, dependent on the policy adopted. Some wait until. The RT-PCR test negative, the test turned negative to declare somebody removed or recovered. Some just wait for few days after symptoms are gone to declare person removed. On the other end is uh, uh, this is really a biological parameter uh, estimated to be close to 0.1 for COVID. Now, more interesting is the remaining four parameters. So from the The fundamental sutra we have this. Uh, since these three quantities are known uh, on a daily basis, uh, from the standard linear regression, uh, these two variables we can estimate the value of B and E. 
Of course, as we have also observed that B and E don't remain fixed throughout the entire timeline. They change. And that's what the uh, notion of uh, phases was pointed out. Uh, so these, when the values change, it's called a phase change. So uh, what causes this phase change? Well, uh, when we put the value of parameter beta changes, when there is a lockdown, it reduces the mobility of person, so it um, reduces beta. If there is a lot of crowding and there is a new mutant like Delta mutant came in India, then it increases beta. Testing policies affect uh, the value of epsilon, and spread of infection to new areas, of course, affects growth. So when a phase change takes place, that is, some parameter values has changed because of some of these reasons, it's reasonable to expect that uh, the values will drift for some time before converging or uh, freezing to a specific new value. So that's called the drift period and uh, between two phases. And this, all these observations together, now we can use to provide answers to these questions. Firstly, our model shows why this equation that observed uh, thing, that uh, observed phenomena of that hypothesis and equation holding, why it holds for majority of this. The drifting of parameter values is also shows why it does not hold for some things because the parameter values are drifting from one phase value to another phase. And value of E is large in the beginning because if you recall, uh, you just go back to the value of E. E is uh, ignoring C. Uh, e is 1 over epsilon times rho. The rho is a reach. Initially, rho is very, very small. It will be very close to zero. And that makes value of E very large. And as rho increases to something substantial, E keeps coming down, and once the row is kind of close to saturation, then E also comes close to it. That explains this change in the value of E over time. But uh, uh, so far, I have only given uh, as how to calculate B and E, which doesn't tell us beta, rho, and epsilon values. Now, there is fortunately a way to actually extract this beta and rho also from this B and E. And it's given by uh, this, by defining this function f. This is, uh, the space of this function is uh, possible values of parameter rho and c. The rho takes a value between 0 and 1 and c is actually remains very close to 0. I just taken it to be minus one to one as a range. So this function is defined as uh, not worrying about uh, exact definition. What one is doing here is uh, in this space, this is the space of all possible values of rho and c. So take a specific value of rho and c, say r and f. Now once we know a value of rho and c, since we know b and e, we can compute the remaining two, uh, that is beta and epsilon. Once we have all the four parameters, we can compute the trajectory of U and RU also for the current phase. T and RT is already computed through B and E. So, and we know that there is a relationship between U plus RU and T plus RT given by this quantity. So, once we uh, compute these two, uh, this is by, this is supposed to be epsilon, this is supposed to be C. So once you compute this, uh, we get a new set of values for rho and c. Now, if the starting point was the correct value of the parameter rho and c, then this entire process of you know, computing output of f will be give us the same set of values. In other words, the correct values is a fixed point of f. And what we have found experimentally is that the f has a unique fixed point. And further, it can be found very quickly by iterating f for about 15 point times from a random point in this space. So since uh, F is a unique fixed point, then uh, once we find a fixed point, we know for sure that that's the correct value of rho and C and that allows us to get the value of all other parameters. So what 
comes out of this exercise, well, let's look at India. In fact, India now has 11 phases, I mean, the nine. But in last month of two, there have been two more phases. These are the start dates of these phases. These are the drift periods. The value of... <coughs> these are the values of beta. And this is, uh, this is an interesting column, which uh, I want to spend some time on. Uh, phase one is pre lock At that time, last year, beta started with 0.33. And then comes the lockdown. It reduces, as you would expect, to 0.26. And very soon, it actually went down to 0.16 and stayed there for a very extended long time. If you see, it started climbing up only in November. So until October, beta was quite low. And that's with very that low value of beta, we went through the first peak, which was in September. And by October, and peak had started coming down significantly. Then in uh, November, beta started climbing up and stayed there for about at 0.21, 0.22 until January end. This was a time of, this is the festival season time and so people started moving out of it. And then you see here, February, of course, there's a 40 day drift period. So this is really March. That is from February, the parameter values were changing. In March, beta went up to 0.4 nearly. This is the time when Delta variant had hit, uh, which caused the beta to jump up so significantly. Apart from the fact that people were also uh, had become quite careless. And then in April, uh, certain restriction measures were put in place that brought down beta to 0.29. It stayed there like uh, 0.3 and it's come. The last phase, this is, uh, this is still in currently in the drip phase. So don't... Uh, uh, place too much uh, value on the parameter values reported here because the drift period is still continuing. So, this is how the beta values have changed. Eta I'll ignore. Let's go to the last two columns. Uh, but before that, as I mentioned earlier, gamma value I'm fixing through uh, analysis to be 0.1 for reasons explained already. So that just leaves epsilon and rho. Uh, before uh, we go into the explanation of this, it should be borne in mind that uh, while the model can compute all the parameter values from data, there is one value, which is the first uh, initial value of epsilon, that is in phase one, the value of epsilon. There is no way it can compute. So what it requires is an external calibration to get that value. And that calibration is given by a zero survey done at any point in time. So what I have done is I have chosen the January zero survey of ICMR, which uh, uh, gave us uh, about 22, 23% of uh, immune population in the country. I used that to do the calibration here. So one over epsilon uh, turns out to be 23 for that. And as you see, there is hardly any change in the one over epsilon value throughout the timeline. And it is not that one over epsilon was kept fixed. The model was free to choose any value of one over epsilon as long as the required uh, uh, conditions were satisfied. But uh, it turns out that it, for India at least, uh, this value is hardly changed. Now let's look at uh, the rho. As you would expect, initially rho was very, very small. This is in percentage. So 0.1% of the population even in March, April. And it's slowly increasing. But then, in June, it jumped. And then uh, in July, it jumped further. So it's a massive 10x increase, more than 10x increase actually, from uh, in, say, in May to July period. And this uh, jump is explained by the fact that uh, that's a time when the, this reverse migration of workers took place, which uh, many of them carried the infection to different parts of the country. And that's how this uh, spread of the pandemic went uh, to a much larger region. 
And if you notice that uh, afterwards, uh, the row didn't change much. It kind of stayed there. And then it jumped again in April, uh, nearly doubled in April. And then it has again it's kind of stayed there and then it's going up again. It's actually, this is more than 100% that uh, normally won't make sense, but there is a reason why this can even happen. When the loss of immunity takes place, as I'll show you, uh, the row value can actually go beyond one. Okay, so with that set of parameter values, this is what uh, the simulation looks like. Uh, the yellow, not the yellow, sorry, the blue line is the actual daily new infection data, which is taken over as an average over seven days. And this orange line is uh, the model computer, and it's uh, kind of fits rather well with the actual trajectory. And I, as I mentioned, the last phase is still drifting, and you can see this, it's not being able to capture it properly. It will require some more time for the drift to stop and more parameters to stabilize. I can do the same analysis for US, although I won't be able to go into such details of uh, the US because I don't know what are the policies that were adopted. But some observation point here, if you see, beta has jumped in a big way in uh, somewhere around towards the end of March. That kind of coincides with the Delta variant reaching there. So that's caused this huge increase in uh, the value of Delta. So gamma is again fixed and this is also. And this calibration here is chosen again based on a zero survey done in September last year. But all the zero surveys are kind of uh, not clear how accurate they are, so these numbers should be taken with a pinch of salt. Here is the UK pandemic simulation. So this, uh, you can see a reasonably uh, accurate uh, simulation of, of what actually happened in the US. And I, like I mentioned, we have done such simulations for uh, uh, you know, all states and nearly all districts of India. Here is a uh, a simulation for, no, it's not Andhra, this is Telangana simulation. Uh, again, you can see that uh, uh, the computed trajectories match rather well with the actual trajectory. And we have this site, sutra-india.in, where you can find many more simulations. Mr. Agarwal, when was this trajectory computed? Uh, when was the last time you fit the parameters? So, say it depends, I... Uh, for Telangana, I think it was done uh, uh, sometime June 20th or so. So then uh, you're projecting only from June 20th onwards. Up to yes. that time, you're just fitting. Okay. Yeah, so I'd like to mention that. Right, absolutely. Yes, that you compute the parameter values from data for different time periods. So the data tells you what are the parameter values for a certain time period or certain phase, and then you plot that trend. Is there an interpretation to phases that, uh, you know, do they make some physical uh, sense? Or? I think I explained that, that uh, phases are due to change in the parameter values. Uh, contact rate, the beta changes due to various interventions. It can change due to a more virulent mutant running through or change in behavior of people. Uh, uh, parameter reach changes because when the, uh, uh, the pandemic spreads to newer regions. These are the two main parameters that change with time. So I guess the question is, can you project that the phase will change? No, I cannot project how the phase will change. I cannot, no way, there is no way to project when a new mutant will strike or when people will start throwing cautions to the wind. It's impossible. Okay, so now coming to the more recent uh, situation of uh, vaccination. This all calculations so far have been done without uh, any incorporation of vaccination. And also the phenomenon of loss of immunity. Uh, 
there are some people certainly who become susceptible again after getting infected and recovering. Uh, and it's where again our model comes to the help. So actually, we can prove that if uh, let's say L fraction of population loses immunity and V fraction of population gains immunity due to vaccination, then the the dynamics changes of course of the pandemic. The dynamic size changes is captured perfectly by just multiplying the parameters rho and beta by this factor, 1 plus L minus B over rho. So this allows us to uh, incorporate the chain, uh, this loss of immunity and vaccination into the model in a pretty straightforward way. So using that, uh, we, can, uh, we have uh, projected three possible scenarios for future. First is the optimistic scenario. Here the assumptions made are, and these are have to be the assumptions made, we really don't know what is the reality, but we have made a somewhat conservative assumptions of what would happen. First is that 40% of population that was infected before the second wave, that was not infected by the Delta variant, but the earlier variants, have lost immunity after three months of getting infected, recovering, and the remaining stain. This is to take into or incorporate the fact that the Delta variant seems to bypass immunity in a lot more people. Second, 20% of the population infected during, during second wave, that is thanks to the Delta variant, have lost immunity after three months and remaining stable. Third, uh, with one shot of vaccine, 30% become immune after one month. With another shot, another 30% become immune after one month after the second shot. And fourth, there is no new mutant and beta gradually increases to this uh, 0.4 value, which was uh, uh, value it attained in March this year when the Delta variant attained. Uh, the second uh, scenario we plot is a pessimistic scenario. Here, the first two assumptions are the same. Third assumption changes, uh, the efficacy of vaccine, we are, we are assuming somewhat less, 25% after first shot, 25% after second shot. And also we are assuming that a faster spreading mutant arrives by August 10, which takes beta, which increases beta by 25% to 0.5. And then intermediate scenario in between them, where the first three assumptions are same as the pessimistic scenario, and fourth is that there is no new mutant. That's where it differs from that. And beta increases gradually to 0.4 by understand. And this is the trajectory we get. Uh, in this plot, uh, the blue curve is the actual trajectory. Orange is uh, model computed until May end this year. And from that point, this is uh, the three scenarios have been plotted. Uh, the green one is the Optimistic one, mustard one is the intermediate one, and the purple one is the pessimistic one. So there is hardly any difference between the optimistic and intermediate scenario. Essentially telling us that if uh, there is no new mutant, uh, there is the third wave is going to be just a small ripple. Uh, it's only going to be significant if there is a significant uh, new mutant. And there the uh, the peak is somewhere between 150 to 200 uh, thousand cases a day. So now summarizing uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the model. Uh, strengths, well, it's probably the first model that can estimate values of all parameters only from data. There's no need to assume anything except for that one calibration point. And that too can come from a zero survey, so one doesn't. So there is a reasonable accuracy one can assume there. Uh, it can provide an excellent understanding of the past because then for the past, you can compute the actual parameter values and see how various interventions have affected the parameter values. It can also provide future projections up to median term, basically assuming that the current set of parameter values are not going to change to whatever time period it that is true, the projections will hold up. Uh, it can also, as I mentioned, incorporate immunity loss and vaccination easily. 
and uh, as i showed it can therefore we can do a what if analysis through this about the uh, long term future but it has its weaknesses for example if it is uh, currently we are in the drift period as uh, in india for example and in the drift period uh, we can't really say what will be the eventual parameter values which where it will stabilize so the predictions done in the drift period are not going to be correct and of course you cannot predict the future values of parameters uh so for some some useful work for the future uh, i currently an only an empirical observation that the function f that i had defined as a unique fixed point uh, and that's uh, uh i think it's possible it should be possible to prove it so that's something that needs to be done and uh, second also it's very interesting uh, question is that if one is in the drift period is there a way to project and look at how it is values are drifting and come up with a uh, computation of where the values will stabilize because that will make the model more powerful and that is even during the drift period this prediction could be more accurate Thank you. That's all I had to say. Uh, thank you, Manindra, for a wonderful talk. Um, I can take some quick questions. Anyone has any questions, comments? Yes, yeah. I had a question. Uh, yeah. So, if you were to look a picture where you have this linear relationship, and then also intermediate relationship. <laughs> Is the picture at all revealing as to what might be going on? Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Can you repeat, please? No. So we didn't get to see the picture where you have linear relationship 62 percent of time. Yeah. And something else in between. Yes. If you go to look at the complete picture uh, in between as well, is there a is there something that suggests itself as to what might be going on? Uh, no. Well, no. I showed that right. That for every phase there is a very nice linear relationship. but between two phases that relationship breaks down and the reason it breaks down is that the parameter values have changed between the two phases so they start drifting so if the parameter values are not constant then of course the linear relationship will not work no that's true but you have a I mean, you may not have it right now but a picture where you actually show how the you know you're moving from one linear line to another linear line what's going on in between uh, so in between no i don't have that picture with me but uh, it can be uh, it's kind of uh, it it okay uh it the, the curve doesn't go like a straight line it starts like drifting like this right maybe something could be fit to that uh. yeah something could fit to that i really haven't explored that with some impulse that happens and then there's a yeah. stability like you know that Yeah, that would be a very interesting take on this because then if one can get uh, uh, hang of that, then predicting where it will stabilize will be easy. Hmm. Okay, uh, Professor Sinivasan had a question. I guess you have already answered it. Okay, uh, Nagamani has a question. Uh, can you see it, Manindra, on your chat box? Yeah, I can see that. Uh, it yeah. uh, talks about the third wave. Uh, i think i already mentioned that uh, our projections for the third wave uh that uh, that's those are the possible three so i showed three possible scenarios uh and that's uh, what we can say right now under certain assumptions but it seems like the third wave is not going to be a very severe in any case Okay, there does not seem to be any more questions. So um, let me. Thank I had my, a. You had a question, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, this is just uh, if any insight is there regarding the change of the row value the second time, the first time when it jumps around to forty, uh, probably my uh, the migratory workers or yeah. some like some such mechanism. Yeah. Second jump to eighty. Yeah. Any insight? I mean, any. Yeah, yeah, insight? right. It's it, thanks to the very fast spreading uh, delta mutant. so 
that because of Delta, it really spread. See, you, you must have seen the report that it's gone into the hinterlands very rapidly. In fact, during month of April itself, it had really spread to lots of villages and others. So the places which were left untouched earlier were also hit this time. Okay, uh, there is a request for all of you to turn on your video so that we can take a group photo. Our proxy group photo through screenshot. So please, if we could have everyone. Anybody else? Uh, I am leaving this job to my students. They are better at it so to take the screenshots and share with us. I guess that looks the max we can have. Ah, better. Professor Srinivasan, are you joining? I'm holding our poses. I have tried mine. I guess the students might be able to come up with a few better ones than mine. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, uh, let me thank all the speakers uh, of today and also uh, speakers of course yesterday. And uh, almost all of them uh, said immediate yeses and uh, on a very short notice. And in fact, uh, uh, funny thing, uh, I, when I asked Sandeep to give a talk, then he, uh, he immediately agreed uh, within 30 seconds. And then later on, I realized I did not tell him what the conference was, what, what the workshop was about. So he asked me, what should I talk on? <laughs> so then I mentioned to him that it's on COVID-19. So anyway, thank you all of you. And um, depending on the uh, feedback, we'll probably do uh, uh, another one uh, sometime. And uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya will take over and she has some uh, Thanksgiving to do. So. Um. Although it is online, uh, but uh, there's been a lot of uh, help at the back. We have had glitches, but our campus network facility director, uh, Dr. Sanjay uh, Sharma and his team, and uh, our Pranay has been a big help in uh, actually, although we had glitches, it's still, I think it was reasonably smooth and they were uh, really, really helpful at odd hours, all the time calling them and trying to get things fixed. And our students, our student moderators have been there. May not, some of you may not have realized questions are coming and going between Google Meet and YouTube and they are doing it. So many thanks to our students and of course ACRB for the project, Professor Bose for his constant support and our university administration uh, for providing us a platform. As you see, it will be broadcasted through the university YouTube channel. So the talks that we had had would be available to all those interested in researching COVID-19. So already overnight, we have had five, 600 people watching our videos. I'm sure it will reach the, the desired audience through our university portal. So definitely I would thank the University of Hyderabad and our very valuable speakers. Professor Bose has already thanked them and I thank them again for such uh, engaging talks. And we can see it from the comments of your audience that we have enjoyed and Many of them have written they would like to have uh, more such uh, initiatives. And I hope uh, we would be able to have you with us again uh, in not very distant future. Thank you all.